on the cam, bottom limb here where the cam, there's two little clips called E clips or C clips. You can see that here. There's one on each side that holds the cam in place um, on an axle. These are something that you want to check. They can on occasion pop off without noticing it, and then the axle can fall off and fall off and get the other end. When you're checking your bows, you should check your bows each time before your students start shooting. You're going to check your strings, you're going to check your cable, you're going to check your idler wheel, your cam, you're going to check your heat clips. There's a test question what are some things to look for. You're also going to check your arrow rest. These are flipper style rests made by National Archery Products. They're very simple design. This plastic sleeve, some of them have it, some of them pulled off, it doesn't affect it either. Next part of the bow we're going to look at is the cable guard. It's this plastic slide, uh, and this metal thing that keep, pulls the string and cable clear of the arrow flight. If these were all in line, you couldn't get an arrow through them. So the cable guard pulls the cable and the string aside so the arrow can pass through there free. On your string, you'll notice in the center area there's an additional wrap of material. That is called your center serving. That is where your knock locator will go. It's just to protect the string from where you're always constantly knocking the arrow. The bow itself, this is a split limb bow. These are the limbs here and here. This is split because there's a gap between these two pieces. This is the face of the limb. The part that's facing you is the face of the limb. The other side is the back of the limb. It may seem a little, you may want to think this is the face, but the face is what's facing you. Just remember it that way. This machine piece is the riser. Talked about the arrow shelf. It's where you can check left and right hand. Arrow rest. This area above the arrow rest is the sight window. This is where you would attach a sight if you were going to. Once again, no sights in that. You're not allowed to make a mark on them. Yet. This is all instinctive. They aim through the string, down the arrow, to the target. It's a difference from 4-H programs. 4-H have a bow program, but they can use sights, they can use high power compound bow. Girls shoot this bow, boys shoot this bow, fourth grader shoots this bow, twelfth grader shoot. Guess what? A fourth grader could outshoot a twelfth grader, no problem. A boy can outshoot a girl, or a girl can outshoot a boy. Girls at younger ages tend to shoot better. I don't know what the science is behind it, but girls in the elementary um, division shoot consistently better than boys. It evens out as you go out. There's some very good real shoes. Some very good. But all the kids are competing on the exact same level plane. State tournament. When I do a flight of 100 kids, 30 might be elementary, 30 might be middle school, 30 might be high school. Division. It doesn't matter. They can all shoot together. They're all shooting the same thing. All shooting the same arrows, the same bows, at the same target. The only thing that's different is the weight of the bow can be adjusted. The black part here is the limb pocket. This black metal screw on here is the limb bolt. That is where you will adjust the weight of your bows for your students. You will do it using a hex or allen wrench. Find the correct size. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. To turn it right, increases the poundage. To turn it left, decreases the poundage. For every one full rotation, 360 degrees on each of the limb bolts. I just increased this bow, by the way, of 1.5 pounds. One turn on each 360 degree turn on each limb bolt will increase the weight of the bow by one and a half pounds. How do you determine how many pounds the bow is set at? Crank it all the way down until it bottoms out. 
when this is bottomed out, there will be no gap. See, there's no gap between the riser and the black one. When it is not bottomed out, you will see a gap. That gap needs to be the same if there is one. You do not want to have one limb cranked all the way out and one limb cranked all the way down. It will greatly affect the, the shooting of the bow. So crank them all down, all the way down, and then back them off to the desired weight. So say you have a student, no way they can pull 20 pounds. You figure that maybe at 15, that, that they'll be able to pull it. <clears throat> so you want to take five pounds off. Five isn't a nice easy number, we we'll use six. So if you want to take six pounds off of this bow, how many turns on each, each bolt would you do? Four turns on each bolt. One turn on each bolt is a pound and a half, two, three, two, three, six. That's how you adjust them. Uh, any other parts that I missed on that? Should be all in the grip. It's kind of one I forget because it seems kind of obvious where you grip the bow, the black plastic piece, that's your bolt. The parts of the arrow. As I said, East End 1820 aluminum arrows, 30 inches, will always be the NASP arrow. They say NASP on them. It has three veins or fletchings on it. Two veins will be a one color, one vein will be an odd color. That is the index fletching or index vein that will always face towards the archer and away from the riser. We'll have a knock on it and the tip on it, and this is the arrow shaft. So a tip or point, shaft, fletching, odd colored one is the index fletching, and where it clips on the string, that's called the knot. Nass arrows, there's two types of knots. There's a push on and a push in. The one I have in my hand is a push on. This is a push in. The difference is this pushes over a metal cone and a drop of glue is used to adhere. This one pushes into the shaft and does not use any glue. Is that the newer one? Yes. Yeah, that's a They're one. much nicer. They will pull out eventually, but they're much easier. You pop it out, pop a new one in. You don't have to deal with glue. Yeah, no glue. That's the big thing. Yeah. Uh, the tips are glued in. See very little damage. Anybody tell me what's wrong with this arrow? <laughs> it's bent. You got shot into a cinder block wall at about five feet um, in order to get a bend in it. They don't bend easy. There's two ways to bend them. Shoot them into something really hard, step on them and pull up on them. They're really durable, that's why they use them. They're not going to snap, they're not going to splinter, they're very safe, that's why they use them. This one's bent very bad. You can tell it's bent. You may have arrows that are bent just a little bit. Sometimes kids will go down. We talked about pulling them out of the target, sliding all the way down. If you don't and you pick up, you could put a little crink in it. The way to tell that they're flat, if you have a flat table surface, you can roll them on there. They'll roll nice and smooth. Or you can take them and spin them upright. And you'll notice if they have a wobble in them, they won't spin at all. They'll be real wobble. Mm. And if you have a bent arrow, what can you do with that bent arrow? Can you straighten them? Yeah, recycle the aluminum is the best thing to do. Um, use what you can off of it. They're not usable. That's when you're going to take an uh, arrow out of commission. If it has a broken knock, you can replace it. If it loses a fletching, you can replace it. I'll show you guys how to do that. What if I have two arrows, I have an arrow on the target, this arrow comes in and cuts a hole in this fletcher. What do I do then? Do I take this out of commission until I can put a new fletcher on it? If it's just a hole or a rip, you can take the scissors and you can cut a V in. I think I have one that I've cut the V in. 
This one had a hole in the flashing. I just took a pair of sharp scissors, cut a notch in it, and that will not affect this arrow or not. If you're going to the state tournament, we provide arrows, kids bring their own arrows, they're going to be all brand new flashings. And it's like that. Maintenance. On your bows, we talked about checking them. Each time the first shoot, another thing you want to do is wax your strings. Bow string wax, it's a couple dollars, comes in chapstick form. It's kind of like uh, shoe wax if you've ever used that. You get some, you apply it liberally, but not too much. It's warm in here because this is somewhat melted, but uh, you'll get it on the string, you'll take your fingers, and it'll melt from the heat of your fingers at work. Your strings and your cables, it just protects. You don't want to put too much on there, it'll come off and gobs. But just enough so you can you can feel a freshly waxed bowstring. And that just prolongs the life of the strings. It can do a lot for a little bit of time. The kids can do it as part of their um, you know, cool down or something like that at the end of your gym class. Problem with being a PE teacher, you have to maintain all your equipment. You learn how to take care of all your balls, all everything, you know, and organize them, or otherwise, in a year or two, you'll have nothing. And luckily, this equipment is really easy to maintain. And as I said, if you're, you have a local pro shop, most of them will be more than willing to help you out there because they see that there is money involved. And Lafayette does have a, a local pro shop. That in order to replace a missing collection, If you have lost a fletching or a fletching is tore off, then you want to replace it yourself. When you buy a kit of equipment, it comes with a repair kit. You'll get fletchings, you'll get knocks, um, tips, things like that. Where that fletching was, there will usually be some uh, leftover residue, glue, and a little bit of a vein. I like to just use a nice sharp hobby knife, clean it off. Then what you'll do is you'll take isopropyl alcohol, which it's not rubbing alcohol, it's 91% isopropyl alcohol. It's pretty strong, potent stuff. You can get it at Walmart Walgreens. You don't need to have a prescription or anything. But take it, get cotton swab, or I like to use those little flat cotton rounds that I steal from my girlfriend. And she keeps wondering where they go. Uh, put a little bit of alcohol on there and you'll wipe it clean and that'll take off any leftover glue residue. Once you have it all clean, you're going to use your fletching jig. Fletching jig will look something like this. I use a little spring clamp and clamp it to the table. It comes with this piece that has a magnet. What this does is your arrow, there's a little piece of plastic in there that simulates your string so that it can kind of clip on in there. And it's got a setting for where three archery veins should go on an arrow. And as you turn, it'll click. That's where each vein goes. Now if you already have an arrow that already has two veins and you just need one, you need to line that up so that when it clicks, you're like, okay, that's where the vein's supposed to be. You can adjust, it can go on there two ways. See how that, that's set up there, it's straight with there. Once I put this magnet part on there, it's going to be lined up with that flutch. Just kind of play with it a little bit. It's got instructions on the package, um, it's rather simple. There's a really good YouTube video of it. So would you not recommend the uh, fletches that come with the little sleeve that you dip them in boiling water? They're not allowed. Well, that's true. This is NASPAR. Yeah. NASPAR should be so. Uh, those are nice. I mean, they're nice to use, but they're not a lot. That's perfect. <laughs> um, you'll get this lined up. So that's right. You move to where you need the vein. You will take your vein and, and put it in here. Let me grab one. Yeah. 
You have to be careful. You know, when you're putting these on, if it's an index vein, it has to be different. If it's not an index vein, then it has to match. You'll get your vein and you'll put it in your clamp. You'll put a little, just a real small bead of glue on there. Uh, there's glue called Flesh Type, made by Easton. Dries in about 10 seconds. You put a bead of glue on there to get it lined up. You'll push it down. It's even. I'll even get some glue and we'll, I'll show you how quick it dries. It's kind of like super glue where you use it once and it's half glue on it. On a real fine bead, and I like to take the tip and kind of smooth it out. sit on there for literally it takes about five or six seconds. And your flash is on there. Now that one I did real quick so it's kind of really correct the demonstration. Um, and that's on there. You can put a drop of glue at the front, drop of glue at the back, and go along it a little bit. Um, it won't really affect the arrow flight or anything like that. It's it's real simple. It just takes a couple minutes. Last thing I need to show you is the knot locator. If you're familiar with archery, they have a brass knot locator that clamps onto the string. Is there like a stringing class? I don't know what's going on in there. It sounds like somebody's dying. I do this for demonstration, it always confuses people, but pretend this arrow shaft is the string of the bow. Send this white string is a piece of serving string. This is, aren't tying these on the arrows, this goes on the bow string. What it is, is a knock locator, they have the brass ones that squeeze on, NASP doesn't allow them to be used, because there is a chance that one could fly off. Again, safety, they have baby proofed this thing basically is the way I like to put it so that nobody gets hurt because they don't want the program to go. You can also, when the bows come from the factory, they have a little piece of heat shrink tubing that they use to knock out here. After time it gets loose and it moves up and down. So you can tie one on with a piece of serving string that they give you. And all you take about a 12 inch piece of string. Would you mind holding that for me? Just hold the end of it. Take a 12 inch piece of string and you go around the string. I'll show you a bow square which you use to line up where it goes. Once you get your mark on your string, you take that string and you're going to tie seven knots. The first one is going to be a surgeon's knot, which is just overhand knot, overhand knot again. This is all laid out in your book. Let me go through it kind of quick, but it's all laid out in your book. And this isn't the important stuff. The important stuff is what we went over before about the class. You can get people to do this stuff for you or you can learn. Tie that surgeon's knot, then you're going to tie on the opposite side of the string. You're going to tie five overhand knots in succession. One, two, three, whoops, three, four, five, and then you're going to finish with another surgeon's knot. I cut myself a little short on the string, but I think I'll get it. Because the surgeon knot doesn't come undone. Yeah, huh? that holds it tight. <clears throat> so now what you have is, is something like that, and it'll be on your string. And if you noticed where you were knocking arrows, I think all of these had, had string knock locators. You saw it on there, it's just a little bump, um, but it's enough to show them where, where to put. Now these ends, what you'll do is you'll cut them real close, and you'll take a Bic lighter or a match, and you'll hold, hold it up, and you'll just keep it away. You don't need to get real close. And you'll put a little bitty bit of heat to that string, and it'll start to, to melt. 
And when it does, just lick your finger and push it onto the rest screen and it'll seal right up. They will have to be replaced every so often, but it, it literally takes a couple minutes a piece um, to do those. So, and so I'll actually done on the string on the boat. On the string on the boat. Yeah, those, that little knot. It's just you'd never, if he did it on the string, you couldn't see what he's doing. Yeah, if I did it on here, it's black on black, but all I did was I tied that knot on an arrow so people could see it. So that's one tied on the string. He's going over the test, basically, folks. You know, all this is on the test. It's all on the string. Um, and I'll show you the bolt closely. So if you could remember everything he taught you today, you'd make a hundred on your test. This is a bow square. It has two little clips that clip on the string. So and cool. It's like an arrow. You get it to where it just barely rests on the arrow rest. And where it comes across, you tie it, you'll see there's a zero mark. That's where you want your arrow to knock, because that means your arrow is going straight across. So when you tie your knock locator, if you want to tie that, at about the one half inch to three eighths inch above the zero. And you tie it there, that way when they knock the arrow, it's at zero. And it does not have to be down to, you know, the micrometer, but it, it should be pretty close. And you'll see, I'll just kind of see where the zero is in relation. Is there any questions on the equipment, anything I talked about with the equipment? That's so funny. Arrows are all the same. The bows are all the same. The, the nice thing is it, it puts kids on a level playing field, which from my perspective, I like to see. Uh, I like to see the kids that don't normally take an interest in something or being part of a team. If a kid can be on a team at school, they're much more involved in that school. They have more school pride. They want to be there. If a student's just there because they have to be there, it's going to be harder for them. You know, they don't, when you go to college, or I guess when I think of, of going to college, you're paying for it or somebody's paying for it, and you realize that it's a lot of money and it's something you want to do or you should want to be there or else you shouldn't be there. Well, with kids, if they're at school and, you know, they have to go, and my girlfriend has a nine-year-old that dreads going to school every day, but, you know, it's, if they have something to go there and look forward to, it, it makes it that much better for them. And you're going to have schools, you guys are going to find, you might go to a school and you might have a tough time getting this program. They're going to tell you no a bunch of times. Um, keep with it because it is a worthwhile program or else it wouldn't be uh, 
uh, dealing with more kids than little leagues. So. And definitely not 9.8 million students. Any other questions that you guys can come up with while you've got me here? You guys do have a test to take. I mean, there's some really hard questions. There are a couple questions that people always get wrong, no matter how many times I go over them. On an arrow, there is three veins. Two are one color. One is a different color. If you had a picture on a test of that arrow and it said, name this part, and underneath it it said in parentheses, different color, and it was pointing <laughs> to one of the flashings, you would want to put what? Index yes. flashing. Not just flat. I say that the same way to every class, and 90% of people are going to do that. <laughs> That's so, funny. Uh, we talk about draw length. When you determine an archer's draw length is correct, there will be a line drawn through the, the string ball to where on the archer's elbow. The inside of the archer's elbow. The way it asks the question, it asks, where is the elbow? It says, is the elbow on a straight line with the string bow? And the answer is no, that would be too long because the elbow should be just beyond that, that line because it's the inside of the elbow that should be in a straight line. Does everybody understand that? It's kind of, I don't like the way the question's worded because it is, it's like that long, yeah. and it's kind of confusing, but when you have the correct drawing, that line drawn through that string will hit you here, which means that your elbow will be slightly outside of that, that line. Um, Racquetball can't be that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about gym floors. Not schools aren't going to have an archery range, probably. This can be taught outside as well. You can do it outside, but in, you know wind effects and things like that. You do remember that the net has to be secured. You can't use a lot of gym teachers think I'll use volleyball poles <laughs> that have the sand in them to hang the curtain. They'll fall over that. Curtain's head has to be usually strung from girders or put an anchor bolt in the wall, something to that effect. Haven't um, people used basketball goals yeah, before? Yeah, we time off of basketball goals a lot of times. On the arrow curtain, something I didn't mention, when that arrow curtain is hung, this one, see how it's right at the floor, but it's not actually touching the floor? You don't want that because an arrow can go under. You want three to six inches of that curtain laying on the floor so that those arrows can't go underneath it. If they hit the floor before and skid, they want to run into that curtain. If you're, we talked about gym floor finishes, you're doing this at your school, some schools will let the teach, some of my schools have let teachers put permanent gym lines on their floor for NASP archery, they're that into it. Most of them won't. Don't use duct tape. <laughs> Your basketball coach will be really mad. Uh, use blue painter's tape, and only blue painter's tape. It won't leave a residue. It won't leave a residue on your floor. You can leave it down for a long time, pull it up. It's not a problem. And what I've got there is actually a floor tape for yeah. a gym. Gym floor tape, or someone have even painted them on It's just, it doesn't come up in bits. You know, if you leave the painter's tape down there for a long time, then you got to pull it up in little pieces. Yeah, but it if, doesn't ruin the floor. If your school lets you, gym line tape is mm -hmm. the best. Mm -hmm. Not all schools the, are going to The floor you. tape comes up in pieces. Why can't, why can't I use Destiny's string ball? Just to practice. It's not set very Each string ball is to that specific archer's draw line. So if I moved her, used hers, I would be like this and throw everything off. So a string bow is a personal piece of equipment. 
These bows can be used, you know, it, sometimes it's hard for people, well, any kid can use that bow, why can't any kid use a string bow? String bow is designed for each individual arch. We remember our, remember your teaching positions, face to face, behind the archer's elbow, behind the archer's back, well behind, and remember your CPR. Compliment, positive correction, and review. I want to say reflection every time, but you know, it's just because we're used to hearing that word. It has been a long day, very long day. When, we, when we're gripping that bow, remember we don't want to over grip it. When, you want to, when you're gripping it, you want your novels to be at a 30 to 45 degree angle. These are all really picky things, but they're things that are on the test. So, um, you're holding the bow, you want to see that your knuckles here are at a 30 to 45 degree angle. That just promotes holding the bow square. And remember, you're not gripping it. When I shoot, because I have such a problem with gripping things tight, the way they broke me of it was to point my finger straight out. Okay. So that's the way I shoot my hunting bow. So when I do this in class, I usually, and people call me on it all the time, but I usually am like that. They tell you to relax your fingers and just let them lightly touch the riser. But if I do that, I grab onto it. So I always keep mine like that. And if you have a student, that is a good way to, to help them from over-gripping. Just extend your fingers straight out. And that's why you did that too. the reason you over-grip a bow, and it just it causes torque. And torque in a bow is, is one of your worst enemies. And if you hold it just nice and softly, that's really when you let go of a bow, it's not going to go anywhere. They have wrist slings, and I mean, I shoot just like that. I don't hold the bow at all, and when I release, it just it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays. Anything else you guys have for me? You guys are a pretty quiet group, but I know most of you have been through this. Usually, when I just go from what I hear from other educators doing this course, I hear the things that. Just the way that you guys will take what I've done today and use it for yourselves, hopefully. When I go into a school and I meet with teachers that are doing this program in school, I don't ever do it in school. I don't come in and run a gym class. That's not my job. I teach people to run it in a gym class, but myself, I'm not in there every day. So I don't know all the things that they run into. But teachers tell me the stuff they run into. They tell me the things that they do that helped them when they started, and I try and work that into my presentation because I know that you know that's where you guys are going to be, and those are the same problems that you're going to run into. Right. Well, if you guys don't have anything else, try it or.